Hi, my name is Rafael Rizari and I have been a faculty in a biostatistics department for the last um, 15 years or so, uh, first at Hopkins, now at Harvard. And I was a maths undergrad like you all are. So today, my, the main purpose of my talk is to uh, inform you of what biostatisticians do and um, how uh, much int how interesting I find the work I do. So I'm going to uh, do two parts. The first one, I'm going to describe a little bit of what I see is going on uh, in in the uh, in science and elsewhere in terms of data becoming very important and why I think statistics is a very good um, graduate career to pursue if you are interested in this type of problems. Um, and then I'm going to give you in the second part a very quick simple uh, version of some of the current work that I'm doing uh, so you can get a, an idea of how uh, some of the some of the concepts and and um, insights of the first part of the talk apply also in basic biology and biomedicine. So I um, I want to thank many people that helped put together some of the slides shown in these figures uh, and also of course the funding agencies that, that let me do this. Uh, the, there's two people that I uh, want to thank. In particular is Jeff Leek and Roger Peng. They're co-writers of a blog that we keep up on, on some of these new statistical applications that I'm going to talk about today. And then also to the Feinberg Lab who uh, is provided all the data and many of the ideas of the second uh, part of my talk. All right, so this is a phrase, 20th century problems with deterministic engineering solutions that I borrowed from a blog. Here's a link down here written by Cam Davidson Pillon. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And it's, it's a very nice blog post. I recommend reading it. And one of the things that he points out is that um, many of the of the important uh, discoveries and and then um, inventions of the 20th century were driven by deterministic mathematical problems. So mathematics was an integral part of of getting of these inventions into the real world. So you start with a from physics. There's a model that's written down in in the language of mathematics, uh, and you know you have all this theory and, and, and predictions of how things should work out. Then engineers come along and and they create something based on all these theories. For example, something that flies, like an airplane. And there's really no uh, stochasticity or uncertainty in, in in any of this. It's basically you know you you follow these laws, and and at the end of the day, you have a plane that flies. So you know you see listed here several of these inventions. So you could you could argue that these are some of the most important inventions of the 20th century. Some of them that we take for granted. Okay, so this is this is the, these were all possible in great part to mathematics. But there was also some other important uh, discoveries or or findings that were made using statistics and these were not deterministic problems and as you can see they're they're not as necessarily as 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 important as the as the previous list but some are are are, are important and uh, the, there's for example uh, does fertilizer increase crop yield does MRC uh, streptomycin cure tuberculosis does smoking cause lung cancer is is it going to rain tomorrow so these are questions that I don't you can't really answer with deterministic models, uh, it, but you can get a, a a a partial answer using statistics. And I say a partial answer because, for example, not everybody that smokes gets lung cancer. Although on average, uh, we are pretty, we're we're pretty sure now that it does in fact increase your risk by quite a bit. Now, fast forward to the 21st century and. We have something new going on. Uh, the, here in this slide, I'm showing you some covers of magazines and well-read magazines and uh, newspapers talking about big data. So, several fields, including science, are are now being driven by data 
the new measurements are being taken and that weren't before and many of the things we didn't know could be answered with say mathematical models can be answered by looking at data and using that to either create a model or or, or use prediction algorithms to to, to do something like say uh, medical diagnostics so the ability of these data and the ability to analyze these in real time many people think will make many of the 21st century problems statistical problems these are problems that don't necessarily have an exact solution but we can still create very useful uh, products say like uh, tr translators or spell checkers or driverless cars and, and things like that so I want to give you some examples of situations where data is now used to make decisions and in the past it wasn't it was either done by experts or or other approaches uh, the first one is baseball where players used to be evaluated uh, for selection in teams by uh, scouts these were people that would go see them they would go see them run see them throw see them hit and and decide who they thought was going to be a good player based on these observations and a group of scouts would get together they would discuss and and then come to a conclusion about high school and college players but in um, 2001 a, a general manager from the Oakland A's decided that he wanted to use data instead and there was a lot of data available so he hired he hired people that could scrape college websites for data and, and create these databases and they could look through and try to make predictions based on the data about who was going to be a good player without necessarily going and seeing the, the, the person uh, live. Uh, this, is, this is an example I, I've been given for years. This is from a talk I gave six years ago, but by now there's a movie out. One plot I'd like to show, this is a plot I made ten years ago or so, where I, I show that um, the Oakland A's that are right here, um, back when they were uh, doing this and, not, and no other team or few other teams were doing it at least as dramatically as they were, even though they have a very small payroll, that's what's on the x-axis, their average wins in, in two years, in a two-year span was comparable to the richest team in baseball, uh, which was the Yankees and two, one of the teams considered to have uh, very good scouting, which the Atlanta Braves. So another example comes from predicting election results. If you watch the 24-hour news channels, you will hear pundits uh, they get paid a lot of money to tell us what who they think is going to win and how they know what the word on the street is and they have they each have their own poll they sometimes pick and choose polls that go with their narrative um, but uh, the there's many polls and there's a group of people that have uh, downloaded this this these data and started analyzing it in, in, as an aggregate uh, Nate Silver and others other other statisticians and data scientists uh, were able to make very very good predictions about who was going to win elections much better than, than individual polls basically by pooling these polls and weighing them in a way that was um, smart uh, and, and created a, a better uh, prediction so this is uh, again from a talk that I gave several years ago where I was showing the 2008 results here's a screenshot of Nate Silver's web page the night before the election where he's he's calling it for Obama 349 to 189 and the actual result was uh, 365 to 173 so I guess he missed one state um, he also predicted the percent difference pretty well as you can see here now in 2012 uh, his website got absorbed by the New York Times it got much more press and popularity and uh, he did it even better this time. Here's a picture showing you state by state the observed differences between Obama and Romney against uh, Nate Silver's predictions, and you can see that they 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 fall right on, in line. They the the other thing I like to point out it is is that if you include a confidence interval, what I'm doing here is I'm taking like the average confidence interval across states. Different states will have different confidence intervals, but just to make a simple plot, I you just use one. You, you can see that it, it, it's even more impressive that it actually gets that w right as well, the variability across, the, um, across what, you, what, what is uh, expected to happen. 
So uh, the third example is a Netflix challenge. So Netflix wants to substitute film critics who tell us what movies we should go watch. They want to do that uh, based on data for each individual. They want an individualized movie critic and they have their own recommendation system that that uses data collected on their own website to do this. So, so several years ago the company Netflix offered a million dollars to anybody who could beat their uh, their recommendation system uh, by 10 percent. So several groups joined in to try to beat the, the algorithm and one of them was led by a statistician Chris Polinski who's the person who gave me these slides uh, he was nice enough to share them and what basically what you wanted to do was predict uh, for a given person in a given movie what score that person was going to give them so Netflix gave out a table for people to test and test and train I'm sorry for people to train their model and then they kept another table where you would submit they would kept the scores for for another table but they gave you the user and movie and you had to predict the score and then they would tell you how well you were doing and if anybody improved their algorithm by 10 percent or more so here's a data display it's showing you something that's very similar to the first two principal components of the data and what you can see is that it very naturally separates movies into uh, what Chris calls frat house gross out comedies and critically acclaimed strong female roles you can see uh, things like road trip on the left and Sophie's Ch choice on the right and then on the other the second component uh, separates things into artsy edgy and Hollywood big budget movies um, you can see Coyote Ugly on the bottom and um, things like Punch Drunk Love on, on the top. So you know th this group that, that applied a lot of statistical ideas to, to their in, in their development of their methods actually won the competition in conjunction with another with another group. And here's a New York Times article uh, showing them getting their big check. So uh, another, the final example I'm going to give you is ad targeting, and I'm, I'm here. I'm showing you an example of where I was ad targeted. This was an email I, I got from a colleague that wanted to uh, patent some of our algorithms, and I, I, I told him I ra I'd rather give it out open source. So I got an email telling me that I was going to get uh, pictures from his yacht once he became rich. So a few seconds after I got that email. I, I noticed that there was an ad for for a yachts on my Gmail account. So clearly, Google is collecting data <clears throat> from my emails, analyzing it, and um, targeting ads that will suit me better. So there's many other examples that are that are like this, where data that didn't exist 30 years ago is 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 now abundant and is being used. To, for example, train spell checkers, speech recognition, and language translators, uh, digitizing books, fields where biostatisticians are more involved, like, like people who are in the departments where I work, or medical diagnostics, personalized medicine, and basic biology. So, uh, this blog, simplystatistics.org, that I write with Roger Peng and Jeff Leek, uh, we describe applications that we think are interesting that we see in the in the reg in the lay press and other places so you might if you want to learn about more of these things just you should check out the blog all right so in basic biology where i do a lot of work there's also a big change in part due to this new era where where there's so much data and where there's new measurements that we couldn't make before so i like to make an analogy to uh, the, to the to Anton van Leeuwenhoek, who discovered who who's the father of microbiology, and he discovered many things, among others, microorganisms, and all the things he discovered were very little things, and that's because he invented the microscope. So the reason he got to discover all these things was mainly because he was the first to see them, because he had this instrument that permitted it.
So today in the 21st century, in basic biology, we, we have something similar happening where we have these new high throughput technologies, including microarrays and next generation sequencers that are in a way like a microscope in that they let you see uh, components or they let you see the cell in a way that we couldn't see it before. Now, in this slide, I'm showing you a, a figure that, that is produced with, with this data, but to get to that figure, a lot goes on. The data that comes out of, for example, this machine is actually a bunch of sequences, and it takes a lot of data analysis and, and computer algorithms to get to the point where a biologist can look at these pictures and, and make discoveries. So back then, this one person could just look through the microscope, but today it's more of a collaborative team that makes the discoveries because you need computer scientists, statisticians, people who know how to look at data to, you know, if you want to call it that, focus the microscope so that the biologists can actually see something that makes sense. So just to give a quick example of how things have changed, this is a, a, a plot on the left, it's a plot of gene expression before the measurement revolution where you are measuring gene expression for one gene and you can see that it's expressed in a given tissue and not uh, the other six basically because it's a big black dot under in the part of the of the filter where, where you're measuring that tissue. On today's technologies we actually get measurements for all all genes at once and sometimes all exons and sometimes even more than that and in the picture on the right we see all those points plotted for two samples for two tissues and if we ask now which of those genes are differently expressed in the two tissues it's a much more complicated answer that requires people that know how to analyze and interpret data so the example I'm going to be talking about today which is an area where I'm very much involved with uh, my collaborator Andy Feinberg and others uh, is epigenetics. So I'm going to give a quick introduction to epigenetics and then talk about how the measurement revolution is affecting this particular field. And I'm actually going to be talking about a specific part of epigenetics uh, in, in, interested in measuring DNA methylation. So this is a picture that is used by human geneticists very often. They show this picture and wonder what explains this phenotypic variation and you know make the claim that it's differences in the genomes of these two people. So there's these locations where, where our genomes are different and uh, you know if we search closely enough we'll be able to explain these differences. But if you, if you think about it these two are actually not that different, although one is much taller than the other. Um, the, the fact is that they, they are both have eyes and noses and they breathe and they eat and they walk and, and etc. So they're not as different as, for example, these uh, different things I'm showing you here. Uh, here's, these are all humans from the zygote all the way to adults they all start off with the same genome when there's a, a zygote has the same genome as, as the, the great majority of cells in, in the human body yet they're as you can see in the pictures and just by thinking about it they're very different and as a second example I have liver and brain cells which are which also have the same exact genome yet they are very different much more different than, than these two guys here so genetics isn't going to explain the differences between these two and epigenetics is a field that is interested among other things in trying to explain these and it, it, it um, is interested specifically in understanding the environment around the genome within the nucleus that's where the epi name comes from epi for environment and uh, the specific component of epigenetics that I'm going to talk about today is DNA methylation which is thought to have an effect on the genome, a structural effect where in, in it can change the way in which a gene is expressed or not. So in this cartoon I'm showing you uh, a gene in, in pink 
and they're, and they're, they represent the same genome. We're supposed, I'm, you know, I, I include this cartoon so you, you can think of it as the same genome. The purple line is the same here and here, but the structure is slightly different on the on the right versus the left. And in this case, the gene is exposed, uh, and the idea is that if it is exposed, it can get expressed. While if it's hidden in here, then it can't. So epigenetics tr tries to understand what are the causes for these changes. It's not genetic. It's something else. What is it? And uh, what can we explain it? Can we understand better? So these are things that you can't see through the microscope. So we rely on these new technologies that that uh, can look inside the cell using molecular biology tricks without uh, actually seeing it through a microscope. But like I said earlier, you, there's th the the instruments that do this produce data. They don't produce figures. So to uh, Understand DNA methylation, and I'll show you and why it's of particular interest. I'm going to run through some cartoons. So the th this is uh, supposed to show part of the genome, and you can see that here's the genome, and here's the uh, sec this two strands of the genome. So uh, I want you to look at t a specific dinucleotide. When I say dinucleotide, I mean two bases uh, following each other, from the th five prime to the three prime. So here's Here's the one I want you to look at. It's a CG. Here's another one, another CG. Now, when you have a CG on one strand, you have it on the other, right? Because C matches G and G matches C. And, and now the 5 prime, the 3 prime direction is this one. So there's something new in this picture that many of you ha might have not seen in when you look at genome, genome cartoons. And it's this methyl group here, ME, that is attached to the C of the CPG. And when it's on one side, it's, it's going to be on the other. This, this CP is, does not have that methyl group. So this is, this is what we call DNA methylation. And when the cell divides, when the DNA replicates, more specifically, uh, that characteristic is preserved. So we start with a genome that has a methylated C here and ended up with two genomes that, have, that also have that property. So you can think of this as a fifth base. So you have A, G, T, C, and methylated C, and these get preserved at mitosis. This is this this is a DNA replication, not 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 uh, reproduction, not not at meiosis. So just to understand why we think this could be important. When a liver cell divides, it produces two liver cells, and when a colon cell divides, it produces two colon cells. So there must be some memory uh, in, in the genome to permit this to happen. So DNA methylation is a natural candidate to explain this because we could have two different genomes now between liver and colon by methylating different Cs. So now when they replicate, you get again a liver and a colon. So Another thing that is important to know, or to understand the rest of this talk, is that uh, CPGs, Cs followed by G, which I'm going to start calling CPGs, are methylate, are, um, that are depleted in the genome. So in this picture, I'm showing you GC, which is not the same as CG. GC counts on 16 base pair bins. And you can see that. Um, they, 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 you see about what you expect. You expect to be to see about one twentieth of the gene of the genome to be GCs. It's not one sixteenth because there's less Cs and Gs than As and Ts. About one twentieth of the genome should, should be GC, and that's about what you see here, right? So for for sixteen base pairs, you see one a lot of ones, some twos, some zeros, some threes. When we look at CPG, it's much less. We see less. Uh, counts. Instead of 1 in 20, we see 1 in 100 or so. Now, uh, the, so the other thing that you need to know is that the ones that do remain, a lot of them tend to group into what are called CPG islands, little clusters. And these clusters will have a higher density of CPGs, and, and, and we call these CPG islands. So these tend to be enriched in the promoter of genes, which makes them even more interesting. So my collaborators were interested in cancer. And the conventional wisdom in 2004 when I started collaborating with them was that 
the what was interesting in DNA methylation was was to look at CPG islands uh, because they had been found, they had found a couple of, of examples where they had seen higher methylation in cancer in specific CPG islands that happened to silence tumor suppressor genes. So that seems like a very interesting, important fact, and um, many people were interested in seeing if they could find other examples. So now that we have in 2000, in 2004, high throughput technologies start appearing for measuring DNA methylation. And then another uh, finding had been this, these are findings from the 80s. Uh, the global cancers, the globally cancer cells had less methylation. So these two appear to be somewhat contradictory, but we're going to see that they actually aren't. Okay, so the the the. the the reason that we got involved is that now we were going to, the, the, our collaborators had high throughput measurements and they wanted to get some help from us analyzing these data that were much more complicated than, than what they had seen before. So we want to measure DNA methylation levels for cell populations. That's an important fact to, to mention. We don't have the technology yet to do high throughput measurements on single cells. We actually have to get populations of cells from, from which you can extract enough DNA to do this. So we have thousands or millions of cells from cancer and then the same for a normal, match normal um, sample. And then at the, at the same time we want to see if we're going to find differences between cancer and normal, we want to see them replicate across individuals. So we also want to have populations of individuals. So there's, there's cell populations and, for, and then for each uh, individual and then we also have populations of individuals. So the, the trick that's going to let us permit, that's going to permit us to, to, to measure this using, for example, a sequencer is something called bisulfite treatment. And what, what it does is it, it takes every C that is not methylated and it turns it into a T. So this C turned into this T, this C, T, this C into that T. But this C is methylated, so it stayed um, C. So if we, if we treat this piece of DNA with bisulfite and then we sequence this, we're going to know that this C was methylated and this one was not because uh, this one mutated and this one did, didn't. So we can take DNA from the whole DNA uh, uh, and then apply this, this, this trick to the whole thing, put it on a sequencer, and outcomes data. So this is what the data comes out looking like. This is the first few rows of a file that contains hundreds of millions of rows. So we, what we want to do now is figure out for each CPG on the genome, so we can go one by one, let's start with this one, uh, and find all those, all those little reads out of the hundred thousand or a billion of them find all the ones that match to this part of the genome and then see how many are C's and how many are T's. So that step is actually very complicated and I, I, we had a computer scientist, Ben Nagmeet, help us write an algorithm to do that, which was key because uh, I was, I was uh, not going to be able to, do, to write an algorithm that would take less than six years to do this. So. Uh, but once we did, once we had that, then we can look at, at uh, all the reads that map to that CG, and then we focus on all the sequences that are all the, all the bases related to the C, and we get uh, now we get um, data. So now we get data. So we get um, three. We get in this example eight Cs and two Ts. So our estimate of the percent, uh, percent of cells in this population that's methylated, for which this C is methylated, is 80%. So that, that's an estimate. It's going to have a standard error. You can think of it as a binomial. There's a true proportion, P, and our estimate is, is 80%. And we can construct an estimate. It's going to be proportional to uh, the square root of 1 divided by the square root of 10, which is actually kind of big. So uh, at the time, uh, the conventional wisdom was that we needed 30x to 
to be able to, to get a precise enough estimate. 30x means we would need to run enough sequencer, enough, get enough sequences so that for every CPG we had 30 reads, 30 of those little sequences landing on it, which means um, that this was going to cost a lot of money. And our collaborators wanted to do this experiment. There was another competing group that was also doing it, and they had much, much more money. Uh, we couldn't afford it, but what we had a, a statistical idea that we suggested, and uh, Annie Feinberg, the lead collaborator, uh, decided to go take the risk and, 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 and use our, our suggestion, which was uh, the following. So the idea was that because we know that consecutive CPGs on the genome, CPGs that are close by are, meth are, are correlated. In other words, methylation profiles are smooth. And this, this is a picture that, that is showing, showing you that. It's basically showing you the correlation in methylation between things that are 100 base pairs apart, 200, 300. And you can see it's pretty close to one when they're close enough, and then it starts dropping off. So if you know that, that means that you can, uh, if you can assume that there's an underlying uh, true curve that is smooth, you don't actually need to have 30x at each single point. You can get away with having less, and we, we suggested 4x mainly because that's what we could afford, uh, and then sm use these, these smoothing techniques to borrow strength across the genome. So this is real data, so I wanted to show you an example of uh, the, the idea. The idea specifically that we implemented is called local likelihood. So the first thing you do is, this is binomial data, so we're gonna, there's going to be a transformation applied. It's mainly logistic transformation. And then what you do is you assume that for any given point, I'm going to just pick one at random, that point, I'm going to assume that the locally, in a small enough window, th this is smooth enough to be approximated by a parabola. So then I fit a parabola to these points, and I get that. You can see it fits pretty well in that, in that particular location. Then I transform it back to the original scale, and I keep this estimate. So that's going to be, this point here is going to be my estimate for that location. And then I'm going to repeat that for every single point, and I'm going to get a curve that looks like that. So instead of using the original data, that's what I'm going to assume is the methylation profile of this particular sample. So uh, to, to demonstrate that this was a good idea, we downloaded a, a published data set for this, that was doing the same thing. This was not, not a cancer normal study, but another study where they had used 30x, and we subsampled it down to 4x, applied our method, then compared it to the curve that was ob obtained with the 30x, and we see that you, you get practically the same answer. Um, you know, we have the 30x in, in um, purple and the 4x in black. So this is a big saving. That's, we're talking tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars for our specific experiment at that particular time. So we did that, and, and we now, could, now we're at the point where we could show the biologist's picture. So now we're at that point of the microscope analogy where uh, we have processed all this data, and we're ready, we're ready to, to look at, at, at pictures. Another thing we do is we we decide which locations to look at, which are statistically more interesting. So that's also part of the of the microscope analogy here that actually makes it quite more complicated and more statistical. So one of the things we, we confirmed, actually, because we had discovered this with microarrays, was that a lot of the chain differences between cancer and normal, which I'm showing here, blue is the normal profiles used obtained with our smoothing technique that we call B-smooth. Um, and then the red is cancer. So here's a difference, and it's very consistent across the three replicates, three and three, three and three, is a lot of differences were like this, and they are not at the CPG island, which is represented with this little, this little rectangle here. You can see the density of the CPGs, which is what these little ticks represent as being denser. It's not happening at the end. It's happening right outside. So we, we find a lot of these. We actually had seen these in, in another 
study that we did with microarrays, and we had came up with this term, PG Island Shore. So this was a discovery that we made that a lot of the differences, uh, observed differences between different tissues and also cancer normal are not on islands that right outside in what we now call CPG Island Shores. And this is now a term that you actually do a PubMed search of the term, you see papers written on, on CPG Island Shores. So it's, you know, it was a discovery made with this modern day microscope that involves a lot of statistical thinking. So another thing we saw uh, was that and, uh, and it, it was a, a observation that explained why in general in the 80s the, there was lower methylation seen globally in cancer and it's that these, there's these long stretches this is now a kilo this is like about a million base pair long region there's these long regions where consistently in cancer we see slightly lower levels and in normals we see levels around 80 percent um, we call these hypomethylated blocks and um, that these were the, the, our competitors actually published a month after us this was their, one of their main findings as well that there was these hypomethylated blocks distinguishing cancer and normal so that's that's my example for today I just sort of demonstrate you what to you what a biostatistician does on a day-to-day -day basis it's, this took you know months of work to get to this stage that there's a lot of data clean up and understanding the technologies and uh, talking to the biologists about what what we should be searching for uh, but you know we feel now satisfied because we helped make a, a discovery so if you're interested in this type of work you should consider a PhD in biostatistics or statistics and uh, one particular program that that you might be interested in is the program in the in in, in which I'm a part of now, which is at Harvard University, and it's in the uh, school. It's run in the school. It's it, it's run by the biostatistics department in the School of Public Health, and you know it's easy enough to to Google this to find more information. All right, and that's where I will end. Thank you.